Welcome everybody to our video today with Richard Hewson, the party leader for the Rejoin EU party. And today Richard is going to be sharing with us all of his top five reasons for us to rejoin the EU. Uh, welcome, Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, very, very good idea, I think, doing the top five. One thing I'm going to do a little bit controversially, if that's all right uh, with yourself, is I'm not going to include anything to do with the economic catastrophe that Brexit is proving to be. Uh, my reason for that is, is not because I don't think it isn't an important issue. To me, this seems a little bit like low-hanging fruit, so to speak. And I'd like us to concentrate on some of the other issues, perhaps some of the less often mentioned issues. So I'm sure many vegetarians and vegans would be very happy to hear that you're going for the fruit and not shooting fish in a barrel today. <laughs> so, like, yeah, let's, let's, let's go for that. So The fish are relatively safe. The fish. There's, there's a few red herrings that I might pick out at some stage, but most of the fish are all right. Better and happier fish for it. Well, from what I can tell, the fish are quite safe in our waters at the moment. We can't, we can catch them, we can't sell them either. Um, so let's, <laughs> let's go. Um, number five, older people able to retire. Um, many people of my generation are slightly older relied on promises that we were given that when we got to our twilight years, we could have a nice comfortable retirement in the country of our choice. And many, many people have chosen to make their lives in particularly Spain, of course, uh, and make their retirement there. Obviously leaving the EU has meant a lot of those people are now effectively stranded from their retirement villas in Spain. What they saved up for their entire lives and now can only be six months time in their accommodation, which to me is a, a shocking example of bad faith and something that I think we need to cure straight away, which is why I think rejoining the EU is certainly a very, very important step to do. Absolutely agree with you on that. Yeah, can't, can't rate enough getting a bit of sunshine, especially at this time of year in the winter and everything else. How much of a difference that makes to you and other, other than taking supplements, I think a nice alternative is to be able to go and get some sunshine for a month. Yeah, and all the lovely businesses have decided to put in roaming charges as well, just to really give the uh, give you a yes, kick in there. Yes, uh, uh, d d d uh, that can't possibly be right, then, I'm afraid, because I'm pretty sure in the referendum it was said that we wouldn't have roaming charges back. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was a promise, and I can't believe that someone would make a promise and go back on it. What people voted for last year was for us to leave the European Union, and we will leave the EU on the 29th of March 2019. We're very clear, we will be leaving the EU on the 29th of March 2019 at 11pm. I'm clear people voted for us to leave, we will leave, and we'll leave on the 29th of March 2019. No, I mean, who would, have, who would think of such a thing? Mm. Who, who would lie to us? <laughs> Where would, exactly. where would you go if you had the choice? Where would you? Where, where would I go to choice? retire? Um, I'd I'd probably like to go to Sweden. Actually, I, I like I like the cold, the sort of Arctic uh, temperatures. So uh, that's probably uh, Stockholm. Probably would be where I would choose to uh, to locate myself. What for the winter in the snow in the mountains? Absolutely, yes. Covered in Swedes. Yeah, not bad choice actually. Yeah, uh, <laughs> at least you get some snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some... I think snow's fairly frequent there. Yeah, I get that impression as well, being in the Arctic Circle. I mean, it's, it's slightly changing with climate change, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, number four, morality, removing citizenship. Yeah, uh, this is a more, more philosophical point, but a few years ago, I was an EU citizen. Now, I never elected to give up my rights to be an EU citizen. I have never indicated my assent to giving up my EU citizen's rights, and yet they have been taken away from me against my will. Now, whether a democracy votes to do something or not, stripping away an individual of their citizenship is an immoral act. And it's an immoral act that can only really be rectified by, of course, rejoining the EU, or at least going for some form of associate membership that would give me that citizenship back. Now, at the moment, I still have my lovely EU passport, which was issued in 2017. Um, I understand that when I want to get it replaced, I have to sign a document indicating that I am a British citizen, not an EU citizen, which I will refuse to do, which means effectively I now would have no freedom to actually uh, move outside the UK at the end of it, unless my citizenship is returned. Who's the document with? Is that with the British or the, the, the European? That's with the British Passport Office. What if you can claim asylum in Europe? <laughs> I don't want to claim asylum in Europe. I'm quite comfortable here in my house, thank you very much. I want to stay here and I want my citizens' rights back. I, I, heard, I heard temptation of Sweden calling there. <laughs> I heard well, that earlier. 
Whether so Sweden is tempting or not, I'm just as barred from getting to Sweden, uh, even with uh, a British passport and making my life there, as I am uh, without any passport at all. Because until freedom of movement is returned, I will not have the right to actually make my home there. I'm aware of a number of people trying to put court cases forward for this. Yes, yes there are. There's, there's going to be. Yes, there's going to be a judgment in February next year on uh, European citizenship, and I'll, I'll wait with great interest to see what the uh, resolution of that is. But effectively, if we get to 2027 and I can no longer have my passport that says I'm an EU citizen, I'm quite content to effectively be a political prisoner uh, in Britain, unable <laughs> to actually leave as a result. So, well, I mean, you know, if, if you like prison, it could be your thing. Well, the, the other thing, of course, which is quite worrying is I will probably also lose my right to vote as well, because now that we're looking at uh, IDs being provided for voting, the only acceptable forms of ID appear to be driver's license and passport that's proposed. Well, as I don't drive and if I don't have a passport, then I will no longer be able to vote, which again will be another uh, retraction of the basic freedoms that uh, I think we used to have in this country. Huge, huge disenfranchisement over nothing. I mean, it's just what what are they like totally. they want us to spend totally. more money on stuff we don't need. Like they keep claiming it's fraud. It's, ama it's been amazing. You watch it in America, and it's like everyone's blowing up about the fraud. You over here, it's like they're going to take another Trump idea and then go with it, and everyone else is going, "What are you talking about? There's no fraud." It's like, well, it's making up absolutely. That. The number of documented cases of voter fraud are incredibly tiny. And obviously those who are documented are also prosecuted as well. So I yeah. don't see that there is an issue of voter fraud. It's again, just putting another barrier in the way of uh, people to actually uh, get out and vote. Right, number two. Uh, no. I, I think we missed number, number three. three. I'm bad at counting today. I'm gonna to blame it on dyslexia. Loss of well, I think, I think you life. ought to get a job at the treasury then with mathematical skills <laughs> like that. Uh, They've got an amazing yeah. way of hiding money over there. They do, they, they do. do. Yeah. I would be perfect for that. I would. Subtly moving past a whole million, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I actually have a friend that did that in a company. They managed to mm -hmm. the, to lose a million pounds um, in, in a company. I can't name who or what company, but they managed to lose it. Then they found it because they realized the mistake they made and then got the accolades for having found that money, even though they lost it. <laughs> they would be a very, very good member of the Conservative Party then, uh, making a complete mess and then partially fixing it and getting praise for doing so. Yes, um, this to me is very, very high on the uh, agenda. If you are 23 or below at the moment, you have had all of your rights taken away from you and you have had no consultation on it whatsoever. And what's more, you're never going to. If either the government or the opposition parties have their way, never will you be consulted on your own future. Previously, you had the right under the Erasmus scheme to be able to obtain a place at a university or an institution of study, even just as a as uh, a worker abroad, the Erasmus scheme would uh, cover you as well. It wasn't just education too, and indeed teaching opportunities came out as well. And not only did you have the option under the Erasmus scheme to study, freedom of movement meant many, many people fell in love with the cities that they studied with and chose to make a life uh, either permanently or semi-permanently in those cities as a result of their study. All of those rights have been taken away from you. If you are 23 or below, I think you should have those rights back. If you are 24 and above, you used to have those rights. You chose to take them away from other people, which to my mind is wrong. What do you say to people that would go, they had the right to vote in the general elections, which obviously indicated what they wanted? Uh, if you're referring to the 2019 general election, the get Brexit done election, uh, even that means, uh, even that's only a couple of years ago now. So let's see, anyone under 20 still hasn't had a right to have a vote uh, on the future direction of where the country is actually going. And of course, those are the people who are going through the educational process at the moment. It's people who are exactly 20 to 21 who would be having that year out abroad when they could make their mind up whether or not that's how they wanted to uh, actually run their lives. And also, let's be honest here, um, general elections are about more than just one issue. There are many, many people who may have voted Conservative in the 2019 election and not have a reason associated with Brexit on it. The only clear black or white uh, distinction we've had was the referendum in 2016. That was the only time you had an unambiguous chance to vote on the future direction of the country. Yeah, that's true. 
I, I find that hard to argue with. I mean, you, you could have the council elections that were recent, but that's not really affecting like anything in particular. That's, the detail. No, that's, that's, that's a bit in your area. Exactly so. And, and also, I mean, sometimes you have to ask yourself what you do actually vote for in a general election. In 2015, we voted for David Cameron and got Theresa May. In 2017, we voted for Theresa May and got Boris Johnson. And in 2019, we voted for Boris Johnson. And who knows who we're going to end up with in the very near future? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely been one of the most unstable, as you know, I'm a historian, this has been one of the most unstable sets of governments I've ever seen in like one row. It's quite incredible that they continue to be able to get mm. a, another Tory government when it goes, right, that's not stable with Cameron. Well, it's not stable with yeah, May. It's not stable with, Bo I mean, Boris is probably out. Well, well let, let, let's just be grateful for small mercies. We could have the coalition of chaos with Ed Miliband in 2015. And, and who knows where we could have ended up there. We could be prosperous. We could be stable. We could be uh, still part of the EU. We might not have a, a chaotic COVID environment uh, around us as a result. Um, gosh, I dread to think what could have happened there. Do I hint some sarcasm there? <laughs> just a tad. Just a tad. <laughs> Number two, general scientific cooperation. Yes, absolutely. Now, you might be surprised that I put this above the rights of young people, but when we're looking at the progress of the human race in general, uh, it has to be through collaborative scientific endeavor. Uh, the discoveries that have been made as a result of many of the European science programs that we are now effectively locked out of has been breathtaking. And as a species, if we are going to ever actually achieve anything uh, in terms of uh, trying to bring our level of existence to a stronger, more stable level, it's going to be through scientific endeavour and progress. So is this more in reference to the Horizon project that got shut down recently? That's certainly one example there, but there are many, many other collaborative uh, European science projects that we're now slowly being locked out of. And indeed, even uh, this was uh, sort of up in the air up to uh, a few months ago in terms of where we were going with many of the uh, many of the partnerships that we have with the European Union. It's now clearer and clearer that Britain is not no longer welcome in many of these scientific endeavours, which is a tragedy. Um, it's not just bad for Britain, it's also bad for Europe, it's bad for human progress as a whole. It's bad for economics as well. Um, I know a number of scientists were complaining about that from Cambridge and Oxford and before Brexit being like, you do this, you're going to cut our legs off when we're growing. I think it's no secret that universities are really not in favour of, of Brexit. As a company now, over half of all of our team are from outside of the UK. If the funding becomes UK national only, that will restrict our ability to expand our work. The main problem, at least for my work, is regulations. We don't know what's going to happen. Like yeah. we're, uh, we're a big part of the business industry. I mean, obviously they talk about finance, locked out of that as well uh, but science yeah. yeah we were definitely at the forefront and we were we were brain drain on Europe one of the things yeah. that concerns me is we're going to flip it around like we did in the 70s you had a brain drain taking place within the UK because Europe could go hey why don't you come study out here it's cheaper more affordable plus you get more sunshine in certain areas of the EU you get a beach why not come and join yeah. us yeah. better food and you get arguably you get beautiful cultural places to be able to go and study as well. Not that I want to suggest that many British cities are not beautiful, beautiful cultural places, but of course, with the That's limited fun. finance uh, that you're offered to study in the UK now, it's yeah. uh, quite tricky. And indeed, I, I have to say, it's actually quite surprising that something like the whole scale of human endeavour, knowledge and progress is something that I only put second on the list. But of course, there is one more pressing priority. Let's be honest. This planet is headed for a very, very dark future. Over the next 100 years, I appreciate a lot of the efforts that people made at COP26, but let's talk about what we all really know is true. It's too late to stop climate change now. It is too late to actually keep our planet where it once was. There is going to be global warming. It's just a question of how big the catastrophe is. Now, we're talking in terms of one to two degrees Celsius in terms of rise. That doesn't sound much, but people have to remember how sensitive our ecological balance is. Now, the only way we are going to stop that is by working together. And the European Union, of the four major power blocks on Earth, the EU, the US, China, and Russia, 
the European Union has been far and away leading when it comes to dealing with environmental change. Now, let, let's be clear, when I say leading, I don't mean they're perfect. I think the EU needs a good pick up the backside, just like the other four do. But we can't do that while we're sitting on our little fortress Britain, building little walls around our island, hoping that rising sea levels is gonna uh, come over them. Spoiler alert, it is going to. And to me, that is the most pressing reason why we should stop messing around with just talking about uh, our own internal affairs and navel gazing, and we need to get back into the rest of the world and start dealing with this issue. I always find it quite interesting when they're talking about global trade and everything. It's like, right, so you want us to send stuff further away, either by aeroplane or by tanker, mm. and it, it's not picked up on the media. I've not heard anyone go, well, wait a minute, you, you want to be pro climate change, but at the same time, you're saying ship things further out. I was listening to a Scottish fisherman the other day talk about how. He's now gone from selling into Europe, which is your neighbor, which you can do by mm -hmm. freight, by train, by uh, a short trip on the boat, to, right, I've got to fly to Hong Kong now. I think it's a 20-hour flight, if I remember correctly. So it's 20 hours of jet fuel being pumped across, whereas Agreed. before, it was a train, which was electric, or a boat, which are being converted into electric boats at the moment. How do the, the, the two policies don't work and yeah. completely contrast each other? It's, it's, it's sad. And yet not talked about in the media and you're like, well, why aren't you, why is that not being brought up, do you think? It is sad. And um, perhaps to a certain extent, uh, there, there's a link between uh, the destruction that we're wreaking on our planet and the lack of opportunities for our young people as well. Because as well as taking away their educational and cultural opportunities now, we are sentencing them all to a quite grim future. Um, I don't think I would really want to be uh, living in the 2070s on this planet in the uh, direction we're going at the moment. And in fact, uh, I, I don't think there'll be many people living in the 2170s the way we're going. I, I think we'll be getting towards global extinction events by that sort of level. Oh, wow. You're, you're, you're that concerned about what, what's taking place. Do you think joining the EU would then help to resolve that more quickly? <laughs> I'd love to say, sign up with the EU and we'll instantly solve climate change. No, that's not true. Sign up to the EU and we can start forcing the EU to be even more proactive in what they're doing in trying to address climate change. Well, on that cheerful Merry Christmas though. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, thank you very much. It's great to hear from you as usual. And yeah, fantastic to see those top five reasons to rejoin the EU. I'm sure if anyone is interested, please send them messages onto the comments section below. We'll put links into the website, into the description. And if you have any questions for Richard, go that route, or you can email to the Rejoin EU party. Thank you once again, and yeah, bye for now.